Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Science Diplomacy, Using International Scientific Collaboration to Build Bridges Between Communities. My name is Alex Adams and I'm the International Programs Administrator here at APS. Um, today I'll be serving as the moderator for this event. Um, and as a reminder, I uh, wanted to say um, this session will be recorded. Uh, it's on the screen there, but just want to make sure that everyone knows the session will be recorded and available online about five business days after. Um, and since this is the last in our series working in the US, um, I would like to go ahead and say thank you to APS Careers, APS International, all of our distinguished speakers, and the audience members that made this series possible. With that, let's go ahead and move on into a little bit of housekeeping. Following today's presentations, we'll have a uh, Q&A session. And during that question and answer session, we ask that you type any questions in the Q&A box located in the taskbar rather than the chat box. Um, you can also access um, a live caption of the event using that live transcription button right next to there. And like I mentioned, the recording will be posted to APS.org slash webinars. Next slide, please. So why become an APS member? Um, APS membership actually connects physicists across the globe, not just here in the US. Um, and we do so through our meetings, online uh, communities such as Engage, uh, which connects APS units. And um, we also you have a growing number of online events that have uh, spurred up during these uh, past couple of years. APS also offers a lot of career resources and opportunities to network with um, colleagues from around the world that can really help spur uh, some international collaboration. Uh, and APS members are also able to get involved in a number of advocacy efforts, uh, different campaigns or uh, programs designed to kind of improve physics in your local area. Um, so there's a lot more to APS membership than what I just mentioned. So I do encourage you to um, go to APS.org slash membership and consider joining today. APS is an international network. Um, we serve a global community. Uh, as you can see, nearly a quarter of our membership is outside of the United States. And to kind of increase in the inclusivity of international voices throughout, uh, APS offers a number of free and reduced membership programs. The one most are aware of is a free one-year student membership um, that's then followed by reduced membership. I believe the rates are close to $25 right now, but we also offer reduced programs for individuals in developing nations. We offer reduced based on your career level. So um, you'll learn more about those at the membership site if you check that out. Um, we also have kind of been increasing the portfolio of internationally focused programs and resources out there. Um, one resource I'd like to point you to is uh, the APS International Engagement Around the World Mapping Tool. If you go to that URL on the screen, you can find a, a link to that mapping tool there. Um, in addition to that, uh, we've got a lot of efforts, Mark will speak to it today, through the uh, government affairs team to promote scientific mobility and really make sure that uh, scientific collaborations across borders are able to happen. Um, with that, I, I just wanna say again, check out that link on the screen there and we'll go ahead and move to the next slide where I'll start introducing our speakers. So our first speaker today is um, Dr. E. William Cole Glazer. Uh, Dr. Cole Glazer is Editor-in-Chief of Science and Diplomacy and senior scholar at the Center for Science Diplomacy, AAAS. Um, I primarily know Dr. Cole Glazer through his involvement on the APS Committee on International Scientific Affairs, where he currently serves as the past chair. Uh, prior to that, or prior to that, he was the chair, but currently he's also serving as the past chair of the Forum on Physics and Society. Um, and as you can tell from both this list that 
displays a small portion of his career throughout the past few years um, and his dedication to volunteerism. He's one of the best individuals to give a talk on science diplomacy that we could think of. Uh, could we go ahead and switch to the next slide and I'll introduce Mark, who uh, Mark will follow Dr. Cole Glazer. Mark is the Director of Government Affairs here at APS. Um, he's been with APS for about eight years now uh, in various roles, all related to uh, all various roles within the Government Affairs Department. Um, Mark previously served as a Science and Technology Fellow. Um, and I believe he was in the in, a, in a, an assembly uh, member's office in the California State Legislature while uh, performing that fellowship. Um, and with that, let's go ahead and turn it over to our first speaker, Dr. Cole Glazer. Uh, thank you very much, Alex. I'm going to talk with a few slides and if I can get them up. Yeah, if you can see my slides now. Yes. Alex, my, they're great. I'm going to try to give you a very quick uh, overview of at least science uh, diplomacy, at least from, from my perspective. Uh, I got my PhD in uh, 1971, 50 years ago, which was also somewhat a tumultuous time like, uh, like today. Uh, because of that, a lot of young scientists uh, in that cohort anyway, were very interested also in public policy issues, what they could do to help uh, deal with things like arms control and nuclear weapons, environmental issues, energy issues. And so I went on a fellowship that was sponsored by the, uh, the AAAS, American Association for the Advancement of Science in the mid 1970s to work for, uh, for Congress for a year, which was my sort of first experience working at the interface of science and public affairs. The congressman there, George Brown, was not a scientist, but he loved science and a number of activities actually dealt with uh, scientific issues. Uh, all I, I was a postdoc in physics at SLAC in the Institute for Advanced Study. I was spending part of my time with sort of this interface of science and public policy. And I had a number of uh, wonderful mentors who were great scientists, but they also spent a lot of their time working, uh, engaging with scientists in other countries on many of these issues. Uh, the two people in this uh, picture right here, the one in the back is Pete Lomofsky. He was head of the Stanford Lunar Accelerator Center, a great uh, accelerator uh, physicist, the, the person in front. Uh, uh, Paul Doty, uh, world-class biochemist at Harvard University. Uh, both of them, although they never served in government, they spent much of their career in dialogues with Soviet scientists and Chinese scientists on how to make sure that nuclear weapons were never used again. Uh, just two other of my mentors that I learned a lot from my career, Sherry Rowland was one of the, the three scientists to get the first environmental Nobel Prize, the problem of chlorofluorocarbon, the refrigerant, uh, destroying the ozone layer, and partly through his and his colleagues' uh, persistence, working with diplomats, working also with the, the industry that produce refrigerants, helped to get the, the Montreal Protocol passed in the in the, the 1980s. And the last, Millie Dresselhaus, the queen of carbon, uh, a great physicist at MIT. I, I worked with her when I spent time at the National Academies. All of these scientists use their reputations uh, to try to establish bridges uh, between countries, as well as to deal with important problems that bedevil uh, countries as well as the, the globe. Uh, although I was a physics professor at the time, but I was spending much of my time related to these sort of science uh, policy and science and diplomacy issues. Uh, but I got a, an invitation to, in 1991, to go to the National Academy of Science, Engineering, and Medicine to uh, head the international program. So I went on, on a sabbatical. For those of you that don't know the National Academy, they were created in the Civil War when Abraham Lincoln was president, so another challenging time. Uh, but part of the original charter for the academy is which written at the bottom and said it would, they would advise the government uh, when asked. The, uh, that's actually grown into a very large operation right now where roughly 200 to 250 studies a year are done uh, to help advise not only the American government, but the, the American people, but the academies control the, the product. Uh, the government does not control what is said. Uh, when I was at the uh, 
heading the international program that I was asked to stay as the executive officer. And so I actually spent 20 years helping to oversee the, uh, uh, the studies. But a number of these studies were done jointly with scientific organizations in other countries. Uh, the purpose was not only to sort of shed light on how information from science and, and te technology could actually advance dealing with these problems, but also it was to help build the scientific institutions in other countries to help become more important advisors to their own governments. A number of studies done with the Chinese Academy of Sciences, such as this one dealing with air pollution, uh, with African Science Academies funded by the Gates Foundation for a decade, helped them become more, more important advisors to their governments on public health issues. And also with the encouragement of both the US government and the Iranian government beginning in the year 2000, when some of the most difficult times uh, between the, the two governments, but they both wanted to maintain a dialogue among their science community, uh, sort of a, a window to have a dialogue among governmental uh, discussions. And so uh, both academies, the US and the Iranian over 20 years held three or four workshops a year, not on nuclear issues, but dealing with environmental issues, public health issues, and, and a range of others and helped sort of maintained a network, even though the governments uh, have tremendous problems. Uh, and, and those actually, those the workshops are now beginning again after a hiatus over the, the last two years. Uh, this was just an interesting study I liked a lot done during my term at the academies. It was requested by the intelligence agencies to make, to look at six countries that had very ambitious plans regarding improving their science and technology. And the, the US government asked, well, what are the indicators that might help the US government be able to predict which ones might be most successful? And it was a very good expert committee. They looked at all kinds of data, but what they ultimately concluded surprised them was that the, the single factor that probably had more to do than any, than any other factor in terms of which countries are gonna be successful had to do with the culture of the country than it had than any other thing. There, there were two studies done during my tenure there that came out in 1999 that had a big impact on the rest of my career when I retired from the academies in 2011. Uh, neither study was funded by the U.S. government. They are both funded by gifts of individuals. This first one on the pervasive role of science, technology, and health in foreign policy imperatives for the Department of State. Uh, was made recommendations that science and technology are so important these days that diplomats have to be aware of uh, the information that comes from, uh, from science, engineering, medical expertise, social sciences as well. And, um, not all the recommendations were adopted, but Madeleine Albright was Secretary of State at the time. And one she did adopt was to create the position of the science and technology advisor to the Secretary of State as a fixed, fixed term of three years non-political position. When, when I retired from the Academy in 2011, I was asked, uh, to take on that position. I was the fourth person to do so and serve from 2011 to 2014. The second, the second study also came out in 1999, funded by a gift of an individual, our common journey, a transition towards sustainability. It was looking at the role of science and technology for achieving sustainable development. It uh, plays on the words of uh, our common future, the famous Brundtland Report defining sustainable development in the 1980s and our common journey was to emphasize that it's really a journey of engagement between the science community, civil society and the political community that are gonna be able to make progress on achieving sustainable development. When I was the science and technology advisor to the, uh, to the Secretary of State in that three year period that was under Secretaries uh, Clinton and Kerry, uh, there were a number of roles that were assigned to, the, uh, to that position in the small staff. One was to enhance the scientific capacity in the department, to engage with uh, science and governmental communities uh, in other countries, to build effective public-private partnerships. Also, which I found quite interesting, trans uh, track emerging scientific and technological trends that happen in, that can affect societies, can affect the foreign policy. Uh, can be disruptive as well as create great op opportunities. The, uh, it's interesting when I was uh, in the State Department engaging with other countries, every country I dealt with, whether it was the most advanced, technologically advanced country or one that was uh, an emerging country or a, a poor country, they all had the same first topic they wanted to talk about. 
how could they actually increase the capability of people in their country in terms of science, technology, innovation, which they saw as essential to trying to compete in this globalized interconnected world, as well as to ensure both prosperity and security for their country, which actually meant that it was a great asset for US diplomacy because every country, even if they didn't like our government, they still admired our universities, our science community, our high tech companies, and they were looking at models in the US was the, the world-class model that they all looked at most. Uh, as part of that time when I, when I was uh, there in the State Department, this one in 2015, countries were the United Nations, the, uh, were actually negotiating on what became the 2030 agenda of the UN, which has 17 sustainable development goals, which are ratified by 190 countries. It's a, it's a very altruistic uh, uh, set of goals. Uh, and as part of this effort, the diplomats recognized that science and technology had to be harnessed better if this progress is going to be made in trying to achieve these 17 SDGs that dealt with social, economic, environmental uh, goals, as well as peace and security. The, uh, so they created uh, something with a weird name called a technology facilitation mechanism, which to help facilitate how technology could help achieve the, the SDGs. And they appointed a 10 person advisory group that I co chaired it for the first two years, uh, 2016 to 2018. So I got very much involved with the United Nations. Uh, that advisory group, like the UN, it has 10 from advanced countries, 10 developing countries, 10 women, 10, 10 men. But I learned a lot from, from all of them. I, 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 but one of the things that we really focused on was how do you turn the aspirational rhetoric of the SDGs into real action, which occurs mainly at the national and the subnational level. One of the things we championed, which has sort of taken off, really has to deal with capacity building in developing countries, creating what we call their roadmaps for using science, technology, innovation for achieving their national goals, uh, as well as their capacity building and their, their SDGs and their six pilot countries now listed at the bottom and there are 20 other developing countries uh, that are beginning to work on this with help from advanced countries. At the end of 2019, I was asked to give a talk on 20 years of science diplomacy uh, at the World Science Forum, which was held in Budapest. And this is the list of, this, of the, uh, the five big issues I saw at the top of the list where the scientific community really needed to help uh, countries deal with these global problems from uh, dealing with advanced technologies of war, including nuclear weapons, uh, for providing foresight and the implications of new scientific technological developments that now we all see how fast science and technology are moving. They're creating opportunities, but they create great disruptions. In fact, uh, what the diplomats worry most about at the United Nations is the disruptive effect of all of the these advancing technologies from AI, robotics, synthetic biology, uh, big data that, that we all hear about, uh, but also maintaining a channel of communication between the strange nations, uh, accelerating progress on the SDGs and building capacity and developing economies. But notice I did not mention a pandemic. So this was on November, 2019. It shows you that scientists aren't very good predictors uh, of the future. So over the, uh, the last two years, I published a little, uh, I'm, the, I'm the editor in chief of a little online journal uh, at the AAAS called Science and Diplomacy. It's all for free to, to read. And it really is not an academic journal, but one for practitioners. Uh, I also get to do uh, editorials periodically. And I just listed the titles of uh, my editorials over the, after the pandemic started. I was one of those who was shocked by how poorly the US did dealing with COVID-19. I thought the US was the most prepared country <laughs> in the world. Uh, and so, uh, but now also dealing with the many other global issues, uh, uh, climate change, you, that all countries as well as, uh, as our country needs to deal with. Every foreign ministry, every country is gonna focus on national interests, but the key is the overlap with the global interests and in helping countries and, and publics to understand that uh, the global interests can become the, uh, the national interests. The, the last thing I'll, I'll, I'll say before I end, uh, the science diplomacy, as you heard, is certainly important for using international scientific collaboration to build bridges between countries, but I think it's actually much broader. We used to say science and diplomacy. We dropped the word and to just say science diplomacy, which to me, I think is positive and indicates that science diplomacy is, is a tool. It's a tool for achieving concrete goals, diplomatic goals, but it can also be uh, diplomacy helping to advance uh, scientific goals. So I think there are many opportunities for using 
science and technology to both engage with countries to help advance the national interest, to help advance the, the global interest. Uh, so let me stop there. I will uh, see if I can stop sharing my screen and I'll turn it over to Mark. Thanks, uh, Bill. And I will now attempt to start sharing my screen. And I think uh, based on what I see on my screen, everybody should be able to, to see uh, my title slide. So first, just let me say thank you to uh, APS International, APS Careers for giving uh, myself as the Director of Government Affairs the opportunity to speak with everybody today and share the work uh, that we're doing on behalf of APS members, uh, really to ensure, I'd say that the United States is a place that's uh, welcoming to international students and scientists and a place where folks want to come to pursue their studies, to pursue their career, or as is the case, I think many people actually want to do both. Um, so what does, you know, what I'm about to say have to do with science, or sorry, science diplomacy, why should we care about visa, immigration policies, research security, research security policies and the like? And I'd say it's because science diplomacy is really only possible when scientists are able to move around the globe freely. Uh, to cooperate and collaborate with each other and to exchange ideas and information. And so why is this a focus of APS's advocacy efforts? Well, we recognize the benefits of having talented students and scientists come to the US to study and work. We recognize the benefits of open science and international collaborations. And we recognize that these interactions uh, between folks uh, from around the globe and this reciprocal exchange of ideas actually benefit all of us uh, in the community. So if I may, I'll, I'll start with the story uh, to demonstrate um, how we're working in this space generally. So about a year and a half ago, APS Government Affairs learned uh, from a contact we have at the State Department that the Trump administration was considering restricting or eliminating two key programs that international students and scientists use to study and work in the US. These are the Optional Practical Training Program, or OPT, and the J-1 visa. Now we knew the problems that ending these programs would create for many in our community, and we knew the damage that it would cause to our research enterprise more broadly. So APS Government Affairs developed a strategy to try to influence the administration and stop this decision from happening. Uh, we collected stories from international students and scientists, as well as their American colleagues on the importance of J-1 and OPT to bring international talent to the US and talked about the benefits that these scientists could have on the US. We thought if we collected these stories, we could deliver them to our ally in the State Department, and then they could use our stories to make the case for having these programs be kept intact. Now, ultimately, through a grassroots campaign that was run out of our office, we collected more than 100 personal stories from APS members, more than 100. And what became clear from reading uh, these stories was the symbiotic relationship between international students and scholars and the United States. Now, certainly the international students and scientists, they come to the US and they benefit from our open research environment. They use our world-class institutions, facilities, and ultimately they can have career options here available to them that, that they might not have elsewhere. Sorry, the US also benefits uh, from welcoming these scientists here. I think you can see by all measures that international students and scientists are an essential part of our scientific ecosystem. So when we shared uh, these 100 plus stories with the State Department, we also packaged them into this short report, which I'm showing here with a quote from a former, former Nobel laureate really as one of the headlines. Now, because of this effort and the efforts of other organizations like APS, the Trump administration ultimately left OPT and the J-1B program untouched for STEM categories. We were successful in this effort. Now, I think it's fair to say that the previous administration's approach to visa and immigration policies impacting the physics community was objectively bad and APS fought them on plenty of issues in that space. And because APS Government Affairs worked with APS leadership and we worked with APS members, we were able to push back against some of the worst policies 
We also made strides to advancing on advancing some of the favorable ones. Now we didn't always win. And I think it's unreasonable to expect that we would. And I think it's also clear uh, to folks in government affairs that we're still dealing with policy impacts from the previous administration and that we still have work to do to make progress in this space. So let me share with you where things stand right now. I've put up three numbers here, 80%, uh, 43%, 25%. And they're in red because they're actually sobering statistics. And these are from an APS survey of our members this past September. So more than 80% of international graduate students and early career scientists report challenges obtaining a visa to come to the US. These challenges include things like significant time delays, difficulty with the interview process, or difficulty proving intent to return to their home country. More than 43% of international graduate students and early career scientists who are currently living in the US perceive the country as unwelcoming to international students and scholars. Now remember that I said that we collected this data three months ago, not three years ago. So this is brand new data. Now the first two stats I gave will probably make the third unsurprising. Based on enrollment data that we've collected over the last several years, we estimate that just in the last two years, we've lost approximately 25% of our first year international physics graduate students to other nations. Now I think all of these signal challenges right to science diplomacy and, and the things that Bill talked about. But with all of that said, there is good news. And that is that our survey also reveals potential solutions. So in that same survey to APS members, we found that 90% of respondents agree that they are quote unquote, more likely to consider applying to graduate school or postdoc in a country that is a clear path for me to stay and work when I finish my PhD. Now we share results like these and, and associated policy recommendations with stakeholders uh, in the federal government through short form data driven reports, some of which I've shown here. We've already produced three or four, sorry, four reports this year and we have a fifth one on the way. Now central to many of these reports are actually input from APS members right through our surveys. So we go out, we collect, <coughs> or we survey APS members Everyone who is uh, subscribed to our government affairs list is eligible to participate in the survey. Now, when I put my government affairs hat on and I look at the results that I've showed, two questions immediately come to my mind. The first is, well, what are the federal policies, right, that are actually driving uh, these numbers that we're seeing? And then what can APS do about it? So if we start by just thinking of our top goal, right, which is, in my mind, we want the US to be a welcoming destination of choice for international students and scholars. What are the policies that feed into that? What are the policies that influence that being the case? And there's really two, uh, I think, that are driving those uh, conversations now. The first is obvious, it's visa and immigration policy. We've been talking about this for years. We know that there are challenges for international students and scientists to come to the US. We know there are challenges to stay here long-term. And we know that we need to remove these barriers and, and end these challenges for international students and scientists who wanna come here to work and study. Now, the second is newer and that's research security concerns. And we're seeing real negative perceptions come from these policies that have been put in place in recent years. Now, there are concerns from both political parties about foreign entities working to illicitly acquire US-based research and technology. Now, APS as an organization recognizes that there are legitimate threats right in the space to national security and economic security. If you think about things like IP theft, trade secret theft, defense related research, and any sy systematic effort by a foreign country to develop secret relationships with US researchers in an effort to transfer that knowledge to their country. However, to date, the federal government's response to these threats has not been balanced in our view and hasn't addressed the risks appropriately. If you've heard about efforts like the China Initiative, these are treating cases of administrative non-disclosure as a criminal activity, despite little evidence to show that there's a legitimate security risk in those spaces. Now, what we've seen from our survey is that these policies are creating a fear amongst members of the physics community. And it's also restricting these international collaborations that we know are so important. Nearly one in five physics professionals in the US who we surveyed have either chosen to or been directed to 
withdrawal from professional activities with colleagues abroad. One in five. So these are two issues that obviously we need to take action on and we need to do something about. So what are we doing? Well, first on visas and immigration, we've been pushing for the last several years for two key changes to visa and immigration policies that would help our international students and scholars. The first is we wanna make the F1 visa dual intent. This would allow international students to, when they're applying for their visa to come, be able to say that they intend to stay in the US after they graduate and not return home, not provide proof that they're gonna to return to the home country. We wanna eliminate that barrier to entry. And the second, we want to provide a clear path to citizenship or permanent residency for any international STEM student who comes to the U.S. and earns an advanced degree from a STEM degree from a U.S. institution. What we saw in our data, right, is it makes it clear that this is the path that people want to pursue. They want to go to school where they can, somewhere where they can stay and have a career afterwards. Now, a few years ago in 2019, we actually worked with Senator Dick Durbin's office on a bill it's titled the Keep STEM Talent Act that would actually do these two things. It would provide F1 dual intent, I'm sorry, it would change the F1 to be dual intent and it would provide a path to residency or citizenship for these students. Now, I'm happy to report that just a few weeks ago, this legislation was actually reintroduced by, by Representative Bill Foster, who's actually a physicist from Illinois and House Science Committee Chair, Eddie Bernice Johnson. And as part of APS's Congressional Visit Day, which is gonna happen next January, APS members will be on Capitol Hill, either in person or virtually, asking their members of Congress to join this bill as co-sponsors. Now on research security, our efforts have been grounded in an APS board statement made uh, in February of 2020, where APS called on the federal government to take a balanced approach to its concerns. We want to balance the risks around research security with the benefits of openness and inclusion of international students and scientists in our US R&D enterprise. Now this statement has been the foundation of our work and we've engaged on several policies in this space and I could go into more detail in the Q&A, but we've made statements, we've provided input, we've had meetings with all of the relevant agencies. And we're starting to see indications actually that these efforts are paying off. And I'll give you just one example here. On September 1st, we sent a letter to Attorney General Merrick Garland and OSTP Director Eric Lander calling for a reformulation of the China Initiative, which I mentioned earlier, and we offered a series of recommendations on how that should be adjusted. Since that letter was sent, we were actually able to set up meetings with DOJ and the FBI on this topic. And our most recent meeting with the FBI, they informed us that they were in the process of quote unquote, making a pivot on research security. So what does a pivot mean and why is that so important? Well, what they said is their goal is to get to a place where science agencies handle the cases of non-disclosure, which I mentioned earlier, and the FBI instead focuses on cases where there's actual criminal activity. This would be a massive step forward for our community. And it's exactly what we've been advocating for with our members for the last year and a half. So because of the work of APS Government Affairs, because of the engagement of APS members, because of the activity of APS leadership, we are getting to a better place on both of these issues, which are important to science diplomacy. On visas and immigration, we continue to see these two provisions that I mentioned being put forward in legislation. And on research security, we are seeing signs, the initial signs, I believe, of the change in posture from the administration. So with that, I'd be happy to take any questions, but also want to recognize the entire government affairs team uh, who everybody on this slide more uh, has had some part in the efforts that I had uh, just shared with you all. So thank you. And I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thank you, Mark and Bill. Um, Let's go ahead and move into the Q&A. We had received a couple questions, uh, one in the Q&A and one in the chat that was sent directly to me. So let's start with the one from the Q&A box. This is for you, Bill. Um, what aspects of the, country's cult of the country's culture influenced their likely success in s and Sure, I, I'll give you an example of uh, some of the positive for using the United States is, is my case. Uh, a positive example related to innovation, the fact that uh, the U.S. is 
much individually centered, very bottom up type of pro type of uh, approach to innovation. Uh, I think that's been great for the fact that the U.S. has been so successful in that. Uh, the U.S. may be less strong in things like uh, societal cohesion. And if you look at the way the U.S. performed and in, uh, in dealing with the, with the pandemic, uh, sort of cut the other way. Uh, the U.S. being so much individually centered, individual rights, it's at a difficult time with all the political divisions dealing with the pandemic, but it was very good for our uh, innovative capacity in the country. Uh, with other countries, the same sort of thing, aspects of the culture can create, uh, can facilitate things like innovation, but they can also create roadblocks, whether it's having a, a great deal of corruption uh, in a country, too much bureaucracy, uh, unwillingness to uh, of the, the leadership of a country to try to believe, to believe it's important to invest in education. So there, so culture has, has a lot to do with how well a country can perform across many tasks. And uh, those countries that were, mo that the, that committee felt were most successful were those that were able, they were willing to try to change some aspects of their culture that hindered innovation. Uh, those are the ones that this committee felt were going to be most successful achieving their ambitious goals. Thank you very much. Um, the second one we received was also a question uh, for Bill, but we have received two questions that are fairly similar that I think you can both speak to. So I'll go ahead and do that one first. Um, the first question was, how can I, as a new graduate student or a young scientists become involved in science diplomacy or pursue a career in science diplomacy? And the related question that we'd received was, how does one get into science diplomacy if they are a science professional currently? Sure, well, I'll give a quick answer and then turn it over to, uh, to, to Mark, since both of us were sort of science and technology policy fellows. Uh, uh, one opportunity, uh, is to actually take one of these fellowships to give the experience of working inside the government at this interface between science and public policy, like the AAAS sponsors uh, for all agencies of the US government, including the Congress. So the APS has uh, congressional fellows, uh, the state of California with Mark's experience. Uh, sometimes they, the requirement is they be US citizens, but there are other, other types of programs. The National Academies has something called a Merzion Fellowship, which includes people who are getting degrees or postdocs in the US who aren't necessarily US citizens to come and get an experience in Washington working uh, for several months on one of the studies that the National Academies uh, are conducting. Uh, so for any uh, scientist that's interested at this interface, I think you can look at these fellowships, you can look at uh, these non-governmental organizations that exist in Washington that uh, are very much involved in science policy and science diplomacy. Uh, so I think there are ways to begin to get interested. Many universities now are uh, beginning to teach more sort of interdisciplinary courses, bringing people from different fields, dealing with the issues that we've been talking about today. But Mark, to turn it over to you. Yeah, thanks, Bill. I, I'll echo um, Bill's comments on the fellowships. I will, and and he did mention APS does uh, sponsor a congressional fellowship every year and encourage people to apply for that. I'm also seeing, uh, as I mentioned this, some some comments in, in the chat uh, about fellowships that don't require a PhD. I know um, for certain that uh, I believe the AAAS fellowship uh, doesn't require a PhD, but a master's degree. I think if it's an engineering with experience and then with some industrial experience, the, the same is true for the California fellowship I did. And I don't know that it is, been finalized, but APS is also considering uh, a change to its requirements for its congressional fellow to be master's degree plus experience. That won't be for this um, cycle, but it would be uh, for the for the next fellowship cycle if it went through. Um, and then APS also, um, you know, we do offer um, internships uh, within the Office of Government Affairs uh, for folks who are interested. Uh, we have um, at any one time, we can have up to two interns, uh, and so we have uh, advertised for those periodically. I know other organizations like APS uh, do similar things, and, and I'd echo uh, Bill's comments on just other NGOs in, in this space. Um, you can look at 
potential opportunities at um, places like Brookings, Aspen, et cetera, that are, that are think tanks uh, that could get, uh, could get you experience and, and kind of your foot in the door to, to the science policy world. Awesome, thank you both very much. Um, let's go ahead and grab that question from earlier that was for Bill. Um, do you have an example of, or examples of when science diplomacy had a particularly significant impact on a foreign policy concern or issue? Uh, yeah, sh sure, I, I, I was actually inspired by some of the mentors that I, uh, that I showed pictures of. This sort of what we call track two non-governmental dialogues between scientific communities, including when government relations are estranged. Uh, during the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, including in the 1980s, there was a very active engagement of scientists in the US and scientists in the Soviet Union on arms control of nuclear weapons. Uh, it turned out uh, when Gorbachev assumed power in the Soviet Union that the, the Soviet scientists Americans have been dealing with turned out to be his key advisors. So all the dialogues talking about how to create a regime dealing with arms control that, uh, and that occurred in these track two discussions turned out to be very influential and actually sort of paved the way for some of the arms control agreements that occur between the US and the Soviet Union in the, in the 1990s. Uh, Another example, of course, is the Montreal Protocol. It was not only the, the scientists that alerted the world to this problem, uh, but it was also uh, the other two factors that were necessary to sort of reach a societal agreement you know, at the, at the international level. One was the fact that many of the big refrigerant companies were producing new refrigerants did not have the same problem as the chlorofluorocarbons, and they saw it in their competitive interests to actually agree to the Montreal Protocol. There was a very talented group of uh, professionals in the U.S. State Department that were very engaged in trying to uh, pursue dialogues with the foreign ministries in other countries. So it took all three actually to reach the Montreal Protocol. But the other thing I might say is, you know, the science is not, is not sufficient. Some of the the, uh, the advances that I consider to be great successes of science diplomacy, things like the Paris Nuclear Agreement, the uh, Iran Nuclear Agreement. Uh, the arms control between uh, the U.S. and, and with, with Russia. Uh, politics can be a more powerful force than science, at least in the short run. And during the Trump administration, the U.S. you know backed out of the Iran nuclear agreement. They backed out of the Paris Climate Agreement, and both the U.S. and, and Russia were backing away from many of their arms control agreements. <clears throat> I still believe, over the long run, that uh, uh, the politicians that ignore what comes from science do it a great disservice to uh, not only the humanity, but to their, their nation. So I think in the long run, science and technology can have a, a very positive impact, but we shouldn't forget the fact that in the short run, politics can be a more powerful force. Thank you. Um, it looks like there was a question uh, regarding how to participate virtually in the congressional visit days. Um, Mark, were you typing an answer to that question? I, I was, and then I realized it might be easiest to just uh, to just state the answer. Okay. So this this year we are planning uh, for the congressional visit day to be in person, uh, if that's what the offices in Congress want us to do, right? So when we email staff requesting a meeting, we want to leave it to them to determine whether or not they want to have that meeting be in person or virtual. Because of that complexity, and because we can't have a hybrid meeting within the congressional office, um, we're actually limiting uh, the congressional visit day this year, as it has been traditionally, to be to be uh, available to people who are in DC for the meeting. Now, should the um, all leadership meeting uh, end up being a completely virtual meeting, for example, then we would have to reconsider uh, who we would be able to participate in the CBD. But for now, the requirement is that it will be available only to people who are gonna be in DC for that meeting. Thank you. Uh, let's move on to are most, if not all, jobs in science diplomacy in DC? No, 
of well, at least uh, for the United States, uh, there are a lot, most of them probably are there, but there are many non-governmental organizations that are throughout the, uh, uh, the US. Many universities have their own science diplomacy engaging with, uh, uh, with the universities and academics in other countries. And also if you look at a lot of private companies now, particularly the big global companies, they also have their own science diplomacy because they're engaged around the world. So I think there are opportunities serving in, in the private sector in the academic sector, as well as in the Washington DC community. All right, we've got one that could be a little controversial. So I'm gonna change it from what should APS be doing in the face of growing US-China hostility to what should professional organizations, just because I think it's a broad issue that affects more than just APS. Well, sure, I'll, I'll say a few words and Mark has already said uh, a lot of the many good things that the, the APS is doing. I firmly believe that it's, uh, it's important for the advance of science in the United States as well as advance of science in the world for, for US and Chinese sciences, scientists to continue to collaborate on basic fundamental research. Of course, they have to be aware of the security concerns and when they're inappropriate government practices that have occurred. Uh, in some cases uh, by, by the Chinese government, but I believe it'd be a, it would be a detriment to the US as well as a detriment to the world if US scientific collaboration with Chinese scientists uh, uh, was halted. There's certainly now more obstacles in the way. You heard how the APS is trying to uh, put things on the right uh, front to have a very balanced uh, approach. So, so I think many in the scientific community are working hard trying to, and trying to help achieve this more balanced approach so we don't have a, a loss of uh, international scientific collaboration, at least in fundamental basic research. Yeah, as, as is often the case, I will agree with, with Bill. I will mention one other activity um, that APS has, has been engaged in, um, which I didn't mention during my presentation. That is, we actually, starting a few years ago, prior to the pandemic, organized uh, a round table that involved uh, American physicists, US physicists, and Chinese physicists. Uh, and that was organized or led by, um, at the time, APS President David Gross. And it was a way to try to find, right, a way for those groups at least to communicate and, and exchange um, uh, information and talk through issues, uh, even when, right, uh, our governments maybe uh, are seeing things slightly differently. And I, you know, I, I agree with Bill, we have to find a way to be able to collaborate uh, on these fundamental research topics. There are many uh, pro, uh, research topics uh, issues today that uh, one country alone can't solve, right? The, the costs are too great for some of these new facilities uh, and we need expertise uh, from those around the globe. So there are plenty of uh, interesting scientific questions out there that you know, the US alone cannot answer. So these types of collaborations and partnerships are, are essential. At the same time, right, we, we do have to recognize that there are other areas uh, within science and technology where we will compete uh, with China and, and, and that's fine, but we certainly have to find a way to, to collaborate on the basic fundamental research that we have uh, historically. Yeah, I, what the APS has done in the dialogues with uh, this, the Chinese science community, I think is extremely important. Uh, the US National Academy of Science is attempting to do the same thing with the Chinese Academy of Sciences. Just as in the Cold War between the US and the Soviet Union, I think now it's, it's important for these sort of track two dialogues between scientific communities, both with China, also between the US and, and Russia uh, to go on to maintain that communication. If, if we are going to influence the Chinese government, it's probably gonna happen by influencing Chinese scientists are gonna have more impact on the policies of the Chinese government than, uh, than we are these days. So all of these efforts in trying to engage with these countries who are at loggerheads, including with the US and Iran, I think are, are extremely important. Thank you both very much. Um, I've got one here from Cheryl Spencer that uh, Mark said he'd like to answer live. So I'll read that one out. It's. Those one in five physicists told to stop collaborating with foreign colleagues. What level of physicists and who told them? It's a great question, Cheryl. So um, the survey, that question was answered by um, 
who we call US physics professionals. So that is anybody who has a PhD and is working uh, in the United States. Now to be clear, it was one in five had either chosen to withdraw or been directed to withdraw from, from a collaboration or a professional activity. Um, so it wasn't one in five that were directed to withdraw. And so it's a combination of the two. Now who directed them? We actually didn't uh, probe that. Um, we have heard anecdotally, right? There are um, cases where university administrators, um, you know, might uh, err on the side of caution uh, and advise against, uh, you know, such activities. Um, so that's just one example. Awesome. Uh, let's jump to a question from Roger Falcone. Um, there are differences in engaging in science diplomacy with trusted allies and science diplomacy with competitors or enemies. Do you have any comments on the difference? Uh, sure, and Roger is as knowledgeable as anyone about this, I, I think. The, uh, I think it's sort of dealing with uh, the challenge from China right now. I think one of the most important things the United States can do besides uh, Fixing some of our domestic problems and increasing our uh, our support and funding for scientific research is engaging with our allies, the other democracies around the world on scientific collaboration, particularly dealing with the uh, uh, many of the emerging technologies. Uh, I think if all the democratic countries move faster together on advancing these technologies, we can move faster than uh, and maybe preempt uh, China from doing things that. Uh, we, we would be opposed to. But I also, as I said, I believe it's important to have a dialogue with uh, the scientific communities and try to advance and basic fundamental research. Just one last comment, because I read this morning a long article in the, I think the Wall Street Journal that the Chinese government is now also restricting some of their scientists from collaborating with US universities and with US scientists. So it's actually uh, occurring in both countries. Thank you. Uh, we might have time for one, maybe two more questions. Um, so let's throw this one to you, Mark. What are the main reasons one might oppose a path to citizenship for students or young researchers from the government's point of view? Um, after they've been screened during initial visas, have provided proof of income, settled down, etc. Yes, this is a great question. And, and the answer, I think, is there isn't a, a reason that the government uh, opposes this. You actually find uh, support for high skilled uh, immigration on both sides of the aisle, Democrats, Republicans, right? Generally, both support it. Now, there are reasons um, that it doesn't, you know, that these things don't haven't immediately passed politically, right? And, and one of those reasons is they get, you know, balled up and, and, and kind of combined with all these other immigration issues, right? That, that are front and center uh, in the country today. But if you go into a, a congressional Democrat or a congressional Republicans office and you just say, hey, you know, do you support a person with the, who earns a STEM PhD from a US institution, you know, having a, a path to citizenship? By and large, almost every office uh, will reply in the affirmative to that. And so it's it's how do we um, either have that uh, move forward on its own, right? Which is a challenge because you know for for the Democratic Party, they they want to address high school immigration, but they want to do so at the same time as addressing all these other issues where there isn't bipartisan support. And so we do two things. We try to move forward on our own, right? That piece of legislation, but we also want to make sure, that at some point, if there is comprehensive immigration reform, the provisions that we care about, right, which is the F1 dual intent and this path to residency or citizenship, that those are included uh, in, in a final piece of legislation. All right. Um, so we've got one from an anonymous attendee that I believe will be our last question of the day. Um, when diplomatic relations are strained, for example, with China or Russia, what role can non-federal organizations play in making sure scientific relationships stay strong or are even strengthened? Yeah, I think it makes it even more important for the, uh, the non-governmental community, whether it's universities, whether it's academies, whether it's professional societies like the APS, uh, 
uh, individuals to maintain engaged when governments are at loggerhead. That uh, maintaining that channel of communication can come and actually achieve uh, great benefit, particularly when there are these windows of opportunity that occur in, in the diplomatic sphere. But just one last word, some of that, I was asking the question of, uh, shouldn't we worry about nuclear weapons uh, war as the biggest challenge? Yeah, and I, I agree with that. I think that more than anything else uh, is an ex existential threat to the, to the world, but also things like climate change and a number of others, pandemics are extremely important too. All right, so I think um, that's all we have time for today, unfortunately. Um, I want to thank both of our speakers, APS Careers, APS International Affairs. Um, and if you had a question for us, because there are a few in the um, Q&A box and the chat box that may not have been answered, uh, if you do have any questions that you'd like answered, you can email us at um, international at APS.org or webinars at APS.org with those questions and we can forward them off to our speakers. All right, and with that, um, I'd like to say thank you again and everyone have a great day. Thank you, Alex. Thank you. Physics 2021.